Ben House, Benjamin House. Um, ben to my friends, Benjamin to my enemies. <laughs> <laughs> you are a, a man of many talents. How we first got connected was graphic design. Oddly enough, a friend of mine in Colorado connected us together. And little did I know, you were about three miles from my house. <laughs> so, crazy story. Crazy story. So, yeah, we met um, there at Global Gallery a few weeks ago. And uh, I'm working on a, on a fitness challenge and uh, look to engage with you on uh, developing this logo and everything. So, um, as we were just talking before we started rolling film, uh, I know you weren't didn't necessarily go to school for graphic design all this is self-taught mm -hmm. and uh you know i'll link to a lot of your designs and, and show people some of the designs but Thank they're you. really cool thank you and i was just i was just curious like how did you how did you get started i guess educating yourself or getting the desire that hey this is something i want to do or how did that how did that all start sure well so a little bit about my story that's unique is that um growing up i was actually homeschooled so I grew up in Lancaster, Ohio, which is about 45 minutes southeast of Columbus. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom worked for Anchor Hawking, which is the glass factory in Lancaster. And my dad worked for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources as a preserve manager and a park ranger. And so growing up, my parents, um, they were very religious and very Christ Christian. They're great examples of, of Christianity and they're, and they're great parents. They follow their faith well. But they felt convicted that we needed to um, be raised in a set-apart manner um, because, you know, in that community there can be a mistrust of the school system. You know, a lot of, a lot of talk, of, you know, a lot of it's conspiratorial, but there's mm -hmm. this belief that there's an indoctrination that happens with, like, the belief of evolution and, and uh, et cetera. Sure. You know, my parents sure. are very politically conservative as well, and so they... They heard horror stories of all the liberalization of the public school and things yeah. like that. Of course, we lived in a rural area, so that really wasn't an issue. But the thing about rumors and narratives is that once they take root, they're really hard to uproot. And so, consequently, I was homeschooled. And I think at the time I hated it because I felt like I was in isolation. We lived out in the woods by Amanda, Ohio, mm -hmm. um, outside of Lancaster a bit. But looking back in retrospect, I think that that was the best thing that they could have done for me. Because it taught me to think for myself. Which backfired in a way because, you know, I unlearned a lot of things that they taught me. But I always had that confidence and that curiosity to want to figure things out. Um, and not really in a mechanical way, but more of an existential way. Um, grapple with big questions. Uh, try mm -hmm. to figure out how the world works. I remember being a kid and I would um, drive into town. And we, were, we grew up pretty poor because there was four of us kids. And my dad worked for the state. Didn't make the most money because he chose to do what he loved to do, which... I respect immensely. Absolutely. But it put a strain on us financially. And every once in a while, we could go into Lancaster and go to McDonald's and we could get something off the dollar menu. And when I came into town, I remember seeing the golden arches and just feeling like a little rush of something that I couldn't explain at the time. It just felt like it was official to me. And whenever we traveled to another town on vacations or whatever we would do visiting family, whenever I saw the McDonald's, I knew what to expect when I went there. And because I had experienced it in Lancaster, I was also really interested in like trains and the logos on trains how they were you know going by in the train tracks we had a couple in Lancaster but you could see the typography and the graphics on the train so from a young age I was interested in it but like a lot of kids um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do mm -hmm. back in high school I wanted to be a rock star which is you know ridiculous um, so I, I learned how to play guitar and also bass and I was in a couple of bands and that led into college where I pursued a degree in drinking. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, organizational <laughs> yeah. communication, which is code for a degree in drinking. I joined a fraternity and yep. kind of squandered my time there. I went to Ohio University, so it's easy to party there. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was in this band, and we were in a folk band. And, um, you know, we started to play a lot of shows, and someone needed to design the flyers for them. And um, I remember at this time, I was working at Chipotle in Lancaster, um, uh, and like over break, and we do this thing called Frontier Spirit. My dad started it back in the 70s in Lancaster, where it's a historical retelling of the history of Lancaster, and, and I'm a reenactor in that, have been for almost my whole life. But I had a music scene with this gentleman named Martin Barker, who's a man I have immense respect for from Lancaster. And he was a graphic designer, and I just kind of, I got and broke up with by this girl who I really liked because according to her, my life didn't have a direction, which was true. And I just felt kind of lost and depressed. 
And Martin looked at me and he says, Ben, I can tell that you're a creative person. And every creative person has a storm brewing above their head. And it's in that lightning and that energy of that storm is always looking for a place to strike. And you need to find something that you want to strike and you need to hit it hard. And it lit a fire in me. And I knew I always was interested in logos and design. Um, so I'm like, I want to be a graphic designer. So I got a bootleg copy of Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. Uh, back then it wasn't Creative Cloud. You actually had to buy the CD-ROM. Mm -hmm, yeah. This was back in 2010. And in my senior year of college, I just started teaching myself, started making posters for the band. I've always kind of had an aesthetic eye, and um, I just watched a lot of YouTube tutorials, and um, I asked people questions. I asked Martin questions, and I mm -hmm. asked other people who I admired, that were designers, some questions. And I just had this uh, insatiable drive to want to excel and make a living in this, and so here I am today. Fast forward, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you have... You have this certain aesthetic. I mean, it's like you, you wouldn't have to... I haven't known you that long, and I think I could see a logo and I'd say, Ben made that, yeah. right? Yeah. How, would you, how would you describe your aesthetic? And where, where do you draw inspiration mm -hmm. from uh, for that aesthetic? It's a great question. Um, it all comes back, I think like so much in our life, we come from a place of authenticity, of things that are meaningful t to us. Mm -hmm. I like to design logos, and I like to design for people that I authentically admire what they do. You know, you're not going to see me designing for pharmaceutical companies or banks or the Republican Party because I don't believe ideologically in those things. Mm -hmm. But there are things that I esteem and value. And uh, growing up, um, so I grew up in a very religious household, and we were not allowed to listen to any secular music. We could listen to, you know... Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman, I'm sure those names yeah. might ring a bell to yeah, you. Yeah, I remember uh, Michael W. Smith, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I listened to a lot of him growing up with my Walkman. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but the one exception to that was my dad grew up in the 60s, and he marched in the first Earth Day Parade in 1970 in Cleveland. Wow. And he loved the Beatles, and he loved like music of the 60s, like Paul Revere and the Raiders, Gary yeah. Puckett and the Union Gap. Wasn't really big into Zep or Black Sabbath or the hard rock, but he loved rock and roll and like bubblegum pop and like yeah. Strawberry yeah. Alarm Clock, the Archies, all that kind of stuff. And so growing up, I didn't really see him a lot because he worked a lot. And he also did a lot of things at the church that they attended, we attended at the time. So he wasn't around all that often. And um, But when he was around, he would be in his workshop in the basement at a wood shop uh, working on projects. He was a woodworker and a good one. And he would always play these old songs, and I would just have these memories with my dad, best memories I had growing up, really, just like asking him questions about things, watching him work, and listening to this old music. And so it instilled with me a love for that era, the 60s and the yeah. 70s. Um, so I draw from that stylistically a lot in my design, because that, that music and that culture resonates with me. Um, I feel like back in the 70s, especially early 70s, late 60s, there was a big back to the earth movement, mm -hmm. and that's crucially important to me. I, uh, I really care a lot about the environment. I feel like living in harmony with the natural world is the way to gain mastery over yourself as a man or, or a woman. I can't speak to being a woman because I've never been one, but I'm married to one, and she seems to agree as well. <laughs> and um, so for me, it's just what, it's what authentically feels... Um, right for me to do is is things that are balanced harmonious and have some sort of natural element if you look at my designs you're going to see a lot of symmetry in them you're going to see a balance uh everything is aligned and tightened perfectly because i kind of believe in this concept of balance between man and nature order and chaos light and dark you know male and female like all these different dichotomies um are very real to me and so I try to transliterate that into my design and also a strong design that's balanced and tight uh, geometrically and graphically is going to have longer use, longer value. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Today I went to Chase to deposit some checks and their logo that, that they still use was designed um, in 1959. And it's oh, I didn't know that. An abstract logo yeah. but it's evergreen. It always looks good because it right. follows, doesn't follow trends or fad, it follows basic geometry, the golden ratio. Uh, Fibonacci sequence and mm -hmm. and the gestalt theory that's pleasing to the eye. So I try to imbue all my designs with that similar kind of mindset and aesthetic. And so it's definitely kind of a retro, but at the same time timeless, definitely rooted in nature, and um, something I hope that can represent whoever I'm working for in a durable way as long as possible. 
Yeah, love it, love it. Um, and I know when the first time we met, uh, you mentioned some of your travels to mm -hmm. inspire you. You spent a lot of time out west. Yes. Um, and, and in nature in general. So that's that's pretty cool. That resonated with me. Um, wh what are you most excited about right now within your design design world? <laughs> Oh man, well, I, I have some really great clients. I'm working on something right now for Columbus Metro Parks. I got to brand Sayota Fest this, ye this year, or last, yeah, this year, 2019. And that was a great time. Yeah. I love those guys. I mean, the director um, is someone who's got a lot of great vision for the parks department. He's a really good man, and he is a great leader. And so I, I really enjoy that. I do a lot of stuff in the cannabis space. Mm -hmm. um, when I go out west in legal states, I enjoy the use of cannabis, yeah. and uh, I like working for companies that work with cannabis because um, there's kind of like this DIY startup punk rock edge to it, Yeah. but also cannabis is, and hemp specifically, is what America was built upon. That was the first crop, you know, Jefferson grew it, Washington grew it, right. and it's, it's got so many good uses in so many ways for fibers, for, you know, CBD. Um, which is which is a great alternative to opiates and, mm -hmm. and these dangerous drugs, and also I feel that you know the um, spiritual use of cannabis can result in a uh, a deeper mindset and deeper connection to the natural world, and so it's been stigmatized and demonized by society because those who smoke by themselves tend to think for themselves and don't need to rely on the societal structures that are forced down all of our throats on a daily basis, and so that's something that I really enjoy doing in terms of other projects. I <laughs> I might be, uh, I might be rebranding a uh, school mascot uh, for oh, that's cool. Urbana High School. Oh my gosh, the hill climber sorely needs it. That, yeah, oh, that's where I went to high school. Are you serious? That's where I went to high school. <laughs> Class of nineteen ninety eight. Sparky. What up, Sparky? Sparky that's right, dude. The, oh, we, he has always looked like Elvis, like this oh, fuzzy awful. Elvis. It's it's terrible. So, I got reached out to by the guy who I think is an athletic director there and. He wants to redo oh, the so mascot funny. for uh, the baseball season. This yeah, year. yeah. And so I looked at the logo. I'm like, man, this this is rough, but this could definitely be updated. And yeah. I, I love I love sports. I think sports are a great way to build leadership values, mm -hmm. to build pride um, in your work, teamwork, um, working through pain, self excellence right. and improvement. Right. And I think it could be cool to develop a logo for them. I worked for. Um, East, my, East Miami, Miami East High School, I did yeah. um, a logo for the lady volleyball team, which is the Vikings, and it was really cool because it was like a, a Viking beard, but he had like a like a, um, a volleyball, half volleyball as his helmet with the horns coming out of it, nice. so it looked pretty sweet, and I think that's how this That's how they got it. Oh, that, that's so funny. I, yeah. You, I did yeah. not know that. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, I didn't know you were working <laughs> on that. Uh, funny. So... Um, so you started this, you know, this design work, this business. I know that you have a quite a large following on Instagram. Um, how has how has Instagram or social media in general helped helped you grow your business? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think Instagram is pivotal to my business. A lot of my clients are national or sometimes even international. And so the reach that you can achieve through using Instagram is fantastic. I mean, yeah. it's a free service. You list out some hashtags. Anyone from any place can find you um, if they're looking through hashtags. And, if, and what I always tell people starting out is no matter what you're doing, if it's an art service that you're offering or a product or an establishment of business like a restaurant or a bar, just load up your Instagram with content because what that shows is a track record. People go through my feed and they can see, I think, around 400 examples. And they can see how I've grown from when I started to where I'm at now. Right. And they can see that, you know, I have receipts. You know, like I, I, I've proven my, my skill set and I've proven my worth because I've done this so many times. Right. And what well, also I enjoy doing with Instagram is writing copy for everything that I post and adding context to what I'm saying so that people can understand that what I'm making is meaningful to me. Everything I work on is meaningful to me because I'm giving, I'm going into that other dimension where inspiration comes from. I'm, you know, like Prometheus, taking that creative fire, bringing it back down and, and sending it out into the world. And so that's a very time intensive process at times. That's um, sometimes it's just an ecstatic process, but every time I do that and go into that place, it's meaningful to me. And I want people to understand that through the content that I write. Uh, 
kind of a pivot here, but speaking yeah. about muses um, and going to the other place, what like do you have like a sequence or like a routine that helps put you in that creative space? Yes. So um, I do. I follow a spiritual path that is very connected to the natural world mm -hmm. and um, the kind of the old ways, and that helps me understand and perceive the world around me in a way that elucidates the shadowy aspects maybe of the metaphysical and brings them to light so that I understand the synergy between all living things, all forms of consciousness on this earth. I try to carry the understanding and that, that humility that we're all connected to each other um, into my work and realizing that my work is not about the glorification of my ego, it's about my honor. You know, the work that I do, I'm someone is, is giving me money, which is a quantification of their time, because they expect me to give them something that's gonna help them achieve something in their life. So we're trading time for time. And what I do and create, you know, I used to want to be a rock star when I was a kid, but now that's the last thing I want to be. I just want to be a man who works hard, who does good and is honorable and commands respect for the work that he does. So is there like, is there a particular time of day that you're most creative? I, I'm, I'm kind of asking this question for myself sure. because <laughs> I'm working on a lot of creative stuff as well. Well, the, the, the great artist and one of the greatest designers who ever lived, Massimo Vignelli, um, who designed uh, the New York City subway maps, among dozens of, of corporate logos back in the 50s and 60s, he said that design is one. If you can design a logo, you, can, you should be able to design a chair or, a, or plan a city, etc. So I try to view my life and work as one thing, and sure. I try to design every aspect of my life uh, intentionally by using design thinking. And that's all about process. That's all about, uh, and inspiration can come from the weirdest places. Like if you're at the gym listening to a song, you could be inspired for an idea for a client. If you meet with someone, um, you know, who you admire or a friend, they can spark something inside of you. If you're walking out in nature or spending time with your pets or your, your family, all of this can bring forth ideas. And so in terms of a time I design, it's kind of weird. Like, I don't believe in creative block. Yeah. I believe in, and the only way out is through, and you got to work through things, and you can't just wait around for inspiration to hit you. But I don't really work like you know nine to five. Like sometimes yeah. I'll work at night for a good eight hours. Sometimes I'll work in the day, and then with the rest of my time, I might go do something that fills me up creatively and helps mm -hmm. inspire me to become a better thinker and um, increase my acuity and connection to the natural world around me so that I can better represent work on my client's behalf. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I'm always curious. Because me personally, one of the most times I'm creative is when I'm exercising. Mm. Um, but it's always a problem of how am I gonna, like, I, you, you know, if you get a good idea, a flash of inspiration, like you have to write it down. Use or otherwise, your phone. Yeah. otherwise it's gone, right? And uh, for, yep. for whatever reason, I think, Exercising for me, and especially running outdoors, mm. you know, with no headphones, nothing else, something about pumping the blood through yes. my body, just, I just get creative. Yeah. Um, I was listening yeah. to something this morning talking about how blood is essentially like, the, it's weird, it's a weird concept, like it's the water of life in a way, because, you know, everything needs water to survive, but blood... Um, and water is, I believe, in a sense of a very, like, it's conducive. Like, you know, lightning hits water, it spreads it out. I think water conducts energy, and blood is made of water. And so I think that there's something to what you're saying when you're working out and you're moving that blood through your body, through, you know, if you're not just sedentary, slouched over at your desk, you're, you're like sending that energy through your entire mm -hmm. body, not just your mind. And you're, I guess, in a way, summoning up these ideas from the subconscious, because that's where all ideas come from ancestral memory, the subconscious, um, you know, the other dimensions where these things exist before we bring them into this dimension that I think that, that <laughs> anything that stimulates that activity inside of you awakens those ideas because all ideas don't come from a vacuum. They come from someplace, right. you know, metaphysical matter also can either be created or destroyed. It's just passed down from another realm, transliterated. It's a gift. And, yeah. It's, give a, them back. It, it's a gift. Um, uh, and you know, I, I had this kind of flash of I had these, uh, you know, some creative ideas the other day, and I acted on them, and it and it worked out really well. And 
there was a lesson and, and I kind of knew this, but, but I really understood it in a deep down way that boy, like these, these flashes of inspiration, these ideas that seemingly come out of nowhere, they're definitely a gift and, and don't squander it. Like you have to just act on it right away. And if you right. don't, so. you don't, but, um, can I speak to that? Yeah, yeah. So I think what a lot of people think about when they're thinking about launching a business, business development goals, personal goals, relational goals, is most of the time we spend our time in the default mode network of our brain, where we're either thinking about what's happened in the past or worrying about what's going to happen in the future. A revolutionary concept that changed the way I think about everything, including business, is there is no past or future. Um, the past, I mean, things have happened to us, yes, we have a memory of those things, but they have no power over the moment that we're in right now. It's gone. Things in the past, even if it's things that we did wrong, they're done. And the question always is, what are you going to do in the moment that you're in? The worries and anxiety about the future are always offset to some, you know, conceptual abstract place that never exists. The only thing we ever have is the moment that we're in. And so many people push off the things that they want to do to excel and to better themselves in life for some future date. Like, don't wait till January 1st to have a New Year's resolution. If you want to go to the gym, go to the gym today. Right. Because you're, because you're going to, January 1st is going to come. The first work, week of January is going to come. And then you're going to put it off. And I mean, I've done that before in my life. There's always, there's, there's always some reason that, uh, I think it was Ben Franklin said, man can rationalize whatever see, he sees fit. Mm -hmm. So there's always good, if you don't want to do something, there's always going to be a reason that you can justify it in your mind not to do it. Absolutely. But, you know, action Jackson, right? Like getting yeah. started is, is always the best way to tackle any goal or to go through any fear like we were talking about is just start. And I think about uh, one of my favorite presidents in, in men is uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And he had a quote that goes, get action, stay sane. The people that are troubled by mental issues, depression, and I've had depression and anxiety in my life, trust me, and I've worked through it. It's the people who don't do anything in the moment. They're, they're paralyzed. They're in a state of, of fear, and they don't want to move forward. They're either stuck in the past or they're afraid of the future, and they're paralyzed by fear. And that's a form of insanity. But if you're a man of action or a woman of action, and you're taking the moment, recognizing what, and that's why I love working out. Cause when you're at the gym, you know exactly what you can and can't push off your body. Mm -hmm. You know your limits at the gym. And a person who knows their limits is able to go into life and handle anything that's thrown at them, physical, metaphysical, relational, spiritual, whatever it is. And so the only way to have a strong mind, a happy mind and a healthy mind is to get action and stay sane. So how would you how would you suggest someone who start with you know how do they how do they get off the couch so to speak how do how do they uh, how do they start acting yeah. it's all about momentum so Matthew McConaughey has this routine and um, every morning he, he has a to do list and the first things on his to do list are get out of bed put on your underwear brush your teeth take a shower get dressed. He writes that on his list, and every time he does those things, every morning he crosses those off. Because what happens is, when you tell yourself you're going to do something and you don't do it, you're dishonoring and disrespecting yourself. And that goes into your subconscious. And that way, your subconscious gives you a narrative of like, you're not going to follow through. This isn't going to happen. You're going to mm -hmm. flake out. You're going to mm -hmm. fail. But, you know, like, like Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try. You can't try anything. You just got to start doing things. And so my advice is just to find some easy things that you can accomplish. Maybe if you're married, it's kissing your spouse. Maybe if you have kids, it's spending five minutes playing with your kids. Do these things consistently in your life. And you prove yourself to yourself mm -hmm. that you are capable of handling things. The other thing I would say is do things that challenge you or frighten you. When you sacrifice yourself to yourself, then you acquire wisdom and knowledge. Because you know what your limits are, like we mentioned earlier with the gym. So anyone listening out there in, in Columbus or wherever, like my recommendation to you is just take a piece of paper, thing on your phone, think three easy things that you can do every day that you can tick off and then build from there. Like take that little snowball and then start rolling it down the hill and eventually it's going to get its own momentum and yeah. become an avalanche of success in your life. Small wins. Get exactly. small wins. Yeah. Develop momentum. Yeah. Um, a little bit back to uh, Instagram. Sorry to sorry to jump jump around here a little bit, but how would you suggest? You know, there's a lot of people uh, entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs that want to get started, and you're right. There's these great 
tools with Instagram and, and all social media that you can use that are free mm-hmm. um, to help lever up your business and, and get, get that snowball you know, rolling the right way. But Instagram specifically, how would you suggest people go about uh, developing their Instagram mm. um, if there may be a new business or, um, or, or something like that? That's a great question. Well, I think that strategy is crucial to everything in life. Um, you're either planning ahead for things or you're catching up to things that have already happened. So that's why, you know, I think what I offer to companies is so valuable because when you create a brand, it's essentially creating a sponge where um, all all the ephemeral abstract concepts about your brand are absorbed into this to this image. And you think about, I think about design a lot and I think it's similar to language. Like we have these, I've always been amazed that we have these like scribbles, these letters that we can combine that are these placeholders for these concepts and ideas that are really the thing that separate us from the rest of the animal mm-hmm. kingdom is the ability to transmit, articulate, and pass down this knowledge. And I feel like that same kind of mystical realm applies to logos as well. Because back to the McDonald's example, whenever you see a McDonald's logo, you think about every experience that you've had at McDonald's subconsciously probably, but you have an impression of that brand based mm-hmm. on that logo. If you see something like, um, let's say, the Starbucks logo, if you're, you know, some mom, you know, that, that's getting her kids to soccer practice, you're probably really excited about it. If you're some yeah. hipster in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, you're probably like, oh, screw them, yeah, yeah, coffee. Yeah, totally. You know, it's like a logo is just a neutral thing, but it, can, it contains a lot of power. And so to, to say that, to, tra- to take that thought to Instagram, you have to know what goes into your brand. You have to know all of these different elements that are absorbed into your brand, what your mission statement is, what your vision is, um, what your core competencies are, what you can offer in terms of content and value to your client base or your customers, and you have to start from there. And people that just post things willy-nilly on social media don't do themselves that much of a service. As a designer, a lot of my work tends to be very simple and and cuts to the chase, because the more simple something is, and yet clever, if it's clever and if it's simple, it's going to be memorable. And people are going to, like, great example is the FedEx logo. It says FedEx, but there's an arrow between the E and the X. Yeah. And once you see that, you feel like you're in on a joke. I, I, yeah, I just noticed that, like, within the last year. Really? Yeah. You'll never see that logo again. And then you can't time. unsee it. Yeah. Exactly. You can't unsee it. And so there is something about everyone's brand that is a differentiating factor between other brands. And by injecting the social media feed with that that thing, also I think too a lot of people in life, um, they come they operate from a mentality of scarcity instead of abundance, especially totally when you're starting agree. out in business. Totally agree. And it's easy on social media to come across as desperate for for likes or for sales or whatever. But even if you're starting out and you have no track record, always position yourself from a position of confidence. Tell yourself that no matter what situation you are in in life, everything is going to work out okay. If that's your core assumption going into any situation, you're going to have a certain level of confidence and control over what you do and eventually mastery over what you do. Because you know that if you lose, you know, a client, there's going to be another one. It's not the end of the world. You're going to make it. You're going to be able to adapt. We as humans are really good at adapting to things. We're also really scared of things. And so to summarize, essentially... Figure out what are the things that go into your brand that make them unique and special. Um, use well, uh, use good grammar and well-written copy to art. If you're just putting pictures of your product on there, give a why. You know, like mm-hmm. Simon Sinek always says, start with a why because the why determines everything else. Let's say you sell socks. Let's say you sell special socks that have donuts on them. For, and there's a demographic of people that like to lounge around and eat donuts. And so you have donut socks for these people. What are you going to say about your product that's going to make people want to buy them? People want to buy things that they feel an emotional attachment to. Right. Right. That's right. why, yeah. The saying is, uh, I, you know, facts tell, stories sell. Yeah. Right? I mean, Absolutely. so you're saying, uh, you know, write something, uh, you know, make your copy a story, mm-hmm. the why. Exactly. Not just, oh, they're made out of cotton, this sort of cotton, and da, 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 da. Yeah, it's like advertising back in the the 50s as opposed to the 60s. So 
you would have in the 50s and the early days of advertising, people would talk about the why of the product. Our product is superior because we use this and this. Our cigarettes are safer because they activate the T-zone or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Nine out of ten doctors recommend this cigarette, you know, all this stuff that was done back then. But then the 60s came along, and I think about the, the ad that really revolutionized things was the Volkswagen's Lemon ad for the Beetle. Um, it pretty much said, this car is a lemon. It's, it's not the biggest. It's not the best. It, it, it had this subversive quality that kind of told a story like, you can trust us because we're not trying to convince you of anything. If anything, we're trying to dissuade you from our product. Yeah. And that creates a sort of rapport with that product, and that was one of the top-selling vehicles in huh. the 1960s. And so, it, but it takes a certain level of confidence in, in both your craft and your product to be able to be a little bit self-demeaning like that. Mm -hmm. I think about people who, let's just say, are in positions of power, and they might be very braggadocious about themselves and say they're the best and they know everything and this and that. Someone who actually knows everything doesn't have to say he knows anything because people can perceive that by being around him or her. A wise man never has to prove that he's wise. He just is wise and people recognize that wisdom. Same with a product. A good product, you don't need to talk up it up all the time or always be promoting it. You just need to keep producing it and, and demonstrating a confidence that you have in the product. Because if you don't believe in what you're selling, no one else will. And that's mm -hmm. not just with material objects. That's if you're a single person looking for a mate. If you don't believe in you, that you're worth dating, nobody else is gonna see that. Right. If you don't believe that you could be a good father or a wife or a husband or a mother or whatever, then you're not gonna be one. It all starts here. Every single thing in our life begins with us believing something about ourselves. And the same comes with business and Instagram. That's really a long-winded answer, but no, it's perfect. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. Ben, somebody that that doesn't know, you know, wants to engage with you, wants to hire you to do some sort of branding or a logo. What's what should they expect in the way of process and and, and, and everything? Yeah. So, like like it was the case with you and I. I really enjoy meeting somebody face to face um, because. 90% of communication is nonverbal, and it's a way for me to, to almost vet the person out, because here's the thing, I'm not hurting for work, like, people come to me all the time for things, and I think one of the most powerful things you can say in business is no, mm -hmm. and if you operate out of that mindset of abundance, um, then, then you don't have to take on everything that comes down your way, and some people are just difficult to work with. And I feel like if you meet someone in person, you get a judge on their character pretty quickly, especially if you have any social acuity or social awareness. Um, and so, I mean, for me to take on a project, I'm going to be investing my time and a little bit of my soul into what I'm doing. So I don't want to do it on behalf of somebody who's going to screw me over or just use it for a bad purpose or someone I just don't like in right. general. You know, I right. have that as a business owner, I have the right to work with or not work with anybody. Um, obviously not for like discriminatory purposes based on you know um, who they are but just but just their more personal aspects of, of who they are right like um, what they represent in their life um, and so I think I love that that hands-on meeting and just just getting to right. getting to hear someone's vision from them getting to see their excitement like when we talked about right. the Decca's challenge I could see that you cared about this you had thought about this, you were excited about this. I'm like, I wanna work with this guy because he, he's passionate about what he does. I'm yeah. passionate about what I do. This is gonna be a good match. Yeah. So we had the kickoff, um, and then we, you know, usually there's a negotiation of price. Um, and the, from there, I establish a mood board where people can drag and drop inspirational work, either of mine or um, of other, other logos or designs that they're inspired by. And um, from that, I will create a first round that has between, depending on the price, three and five different concepts mm -hmm. and up to two rounds of revisions. And mm -hmm. From there, um, my client um, will make suggestions or tweaks to those things if necessary, or if, if they like it on the first go, then that works as well. Right. And then in the end, I do something that a lot of people don't do, which I've discovered is I, I provide the JPEG file, PNG file, as well as the working file for the logo. I've worked with several clients who have given me JPEGs or PNGs of their logo, not a vector version, because the agency or studio they, they work with didn't provide. Yeah. I think that's I think that's bull crap because I my company's called House Design Service. I offer a service and it's a product. And 
it's going to only be half as good to you if you can't use it on your own or send it to the screen printer to make a shirt or put it on a billboard. Right. Because, you know, I think it just comes from a place of desperation not to hand over those files. If someone wants to work with me again, that's great. If they want to work with someone else again, that's also great because... You know, it just goes to speak towards uh, scarcity versus abundance, right? Exactly. I mean, that that would be the, the definition of a scarcity mindset, not not providing that vector yeah. file. Um, awesome. And I'm a lot different. So I actually have a hard time in the design community because a lot of them are really introverted. And I'm an introvert too, Like, but I'm kind of an ambivert. I can also, like, it's weird. Like, I didn't go to art school. I don't fit in with the art scene. I don't really even view myself like as a typical designer, I view myself as a blue collar worker that just happens to be doing graphic design. My yeah. dad, after he retired from the state, he was a carpenter for 20 years and his business was called Howes Remodeling Service. And so I just swapped out remodeling and put design in there. Mm -hmm. My dad's slogan for his business was building quality into your home. My, my kind of like, you know, unofficial slogan is building quality into your brand. Um, and so I yeah. just pretty much just try to approach that same working class blue collar ethic my dad had, but just switch the product out from, you know, f building something physically to building something on a computer that's still a solidly built structure that can help provide yeah. value for my clients. So I awesome. guess that's kind of how I view myself in a way. Awesome. Um, so people that want to engage with you, want to reach out to you, want to talk about hiring you for the branding. Uh, design and what have you. How do they, what's the best way to get a hold of you? I'm really easy to get a hold of. Um, I'm always checking my Instagram. I try to get back with people right away because like we talked about earlier, there's no yep. time like the present. I don't like to let grass grow under my feet. I'd rather smoke it. Yeah. <laughs> In legal states, of course. Uh, of course. Only, of course. Only in legal states. Um, but uh, if someone wants to get a hold of me, uh, my Instagram is at House Design Service. Uh, my email is ben at housedesignservice.com, and that's H O W E S. I'm sure you'll have Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll put it. And my phone number is 614 867 4623. If I don't recognize the number, you, we get a lot of robocalls these oh, days. Oh, yeah, me so too. I'll, I'll always send them a text and say, Are you a real person? Usually they're not. But yeah. if you are and respond back to me, then I'll call you right back. Perfect. And then we can make moves from there. And uh, what, so let me ask you a question. Sure, go ahead. What has your experience been like working with me? My experience, uh, well, it's been great. You know, we met that first time at the Global Gallery and I knew we had a connection right away, right? We had a lot of things that, we kind of thought about things in the same way. We had uh, com a lot of common experiences that we could kind of talk about. And we both spent a lot of time out west. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, you know, I guess first off, I felt like we had a great rapport that I'd known you longer than you know the hour that we first <laughs> met, yeah. and um, and then from there, you know, it was a matter of I had a little trouble with the mood board because I didn't know what I was <laughs> yeah. supposed to do at first. <laughs> but, but, for sure. but but once I I, I, I figured out oh, okay, like I, I need to add things here. That was great, and um, so you had given me I think last week, last week ten days maybe two weeks ago even kind of the first round of designs. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved 75% of them mm -hmm. right off the bat. And uh, so much so that I couldn't choose. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to go around and, and get feedback from other people, which mm -hmm. uh, I'm usually a really decisive person and I just roll with it. Uh, but they were all so good and I, I mean, I had thoughts going through my head. I was like, well, geez, maybe I can, maybe I can use them all in some way. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so as far as expectations being met, I was extremely happy with this, you know, these first round of designs and I, um, just got back to kind of the direction that we wanted to go. So I'm excited to, you know, as we finish this up to see where it goes. But, uh, my experience working with you, cause I had worked with other graphic designers, um, before getting to you, unfortunately, they didn't work out. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like they were um, cheap, cheap in a way that they were, the, the previous designs were cheaply thought out. Not a lot of inspiration, not a lot of, um, not a lot of emotion, not a, just not a lot of soul in the design. And I felt like the designs that you provided me were those things. And so, uh, 
it's been it's been a great experience so far. So anybody needs a design out there, uh, definitely hit up Ben. I, I think you'll be uh, just as impressed and just as happy as I've been. So you guys will be seeing this uh, this Decus logo sometime um, towards end of quarter one, nice. uh, twenty twenty. So um, that's awesome. Well, that's awesome. I gotta say thank you for that. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. It's been this yeah. has been a lot of fun. I lived in Ohio my whole life. I've lived in Columbus since 2013. Started my business in 2017, and this is my home. I have my yeah. my studio is like, or my right computer is literally right there. And uh, my dogs are up there. They're, they're usually down here, but they'd be on my lap the whole time if they were here. But I work with right. my dogs. They're they're my my business partners. Right. Uh, they're, they're head of uh, of web design because I don't care about web design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I love Columbus. It's a great place, and I love working with brands here. I've worked with um, Serif Creative on some things. I've worked with Wolf's Ridge Brewing. I've worked with Eleven Warriors around town mm -hmm. um, as well, and uh, as well as a lot of little startups and smaller brands. Tiger Tree. I've done some. I got some stuff in Tiger Tree. Columbus is my home. I love it here. I'm not leaving anytime soon. And I mean, my wife's from California, so she's always itching to go back <laughs> west. But yeah. I, I love this place, man. And I, yeah. I love the spirit of entrepreneurship here, the ethical approach to business a lot of these companies have, and also that Midwest nice quality and respect for hard work, right. for integrity, and for honorable living. And I, I think this is a great place to live and do business. I'm glad I'm here. It sure is. I mean, I... I was away for about 10 years, came back at the end of, or beginning of 2013, end of 2012. And I feel like since we've been back, Columbus, I was gone 10 years, mm -hmm. and, and Columbus totally changed. Yeah. Um, and since we've been back, I feel like there's a, like we're on this wave here in Columbus. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think it's going to stop. I think it's just, it's like uh, one of those little wave pools where you can surf, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. endless wave. Um, that's what I feel like we're, we're on right here in, in Columbus and there's yeah, there's a lot of reason there's a, reason, a lot of good reasons why people are moving here and will continue to do so so and I've been all over America um, and I've been several places around the world and Columbus is probably my favorite city I mean even I've been to Portland I've been to Seattle I've been to LA San Francisco all the cool places Vancouver Canada that place is pretty but um, yeah. you know all the cool hip places and Columbus right. can match up to any one of them so if you're from this place and this is your home be proud we have the best damn team in the land obviously and we'll find out I guess. we'll find out yeah we'll but we'll fingers crossed I'm, I'm believing it and um, why, don't you, why don't you give me your prediction for the uh, Clemson Ohio State game Ooh man I don't know if I want to jinx it but I think we're going to pull through um the game against Wisconsin, just the adjustments made at halftime was just incredible. Unbelievable. Completely different team. Completely different team. Completely I don't know what we held them to in the second half, like 40 yards or something yeah. like that. I mean, it was, it was just such a tale of two halves. So this is Day's first year as well. I mean, he coached a couple games last year, but I think he exercises tremendous leadership. I feel like he picked up a lot from Urban as well. Yes, um, absolutely. In, in terms of his coaching style, um, in terms of Urban's vision for the team, and I have a lot of respect for Urban Meyer. Um, I think he's an incredible leader, and, and I mean, I know there's some scandal, but it's in the past. So I, I, I tend to look at him for what he's done on the field mm -hmm. and in his life, and by all accounts, he's a great guy. Um, and I think um, I think we're going to pull through with Clemson. I think it's going to be a nail-biter. Uh, it's going to come down to the wire, but I'm going to say 28-21 Ohio State. Awesome. All said and done. Awesome. What about you? Yeah, I've uh, you know still feel like I have a little P PTSD from you know thirty one <laughs> to yeah. yeah thirty one to nothing. Uh, yeah. A lot of history there with Clemson. I think Woody got fired when he when they were punching a Clemson player. I think really yeah. Oh man, I'm pretty sure it was Clemson. Huh. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I was for pretty excited that we drew Clemson actually because mm -hmm. I, I truly felt like all the championships would have to go through Clemson. They're the defending champs yep. and who wouldn't relish kind of erasing the public memory of that 31 to nothing. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Redemption. Just, yeah. Redemption. And so I agree. It's going to be a hard fought game. I love the adversity that the Buckeyes fought through against Wisconsin. Yes. Um, I love the no panic. Mm -hmm. Um, I love the way Day puts confidence in his players even after they make mistakes. 
continues to believe in them so they can believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to pay dividends in this game mm -hmm. uh, in a big way. Um, you know, I haven't thought too much about score. Uh, I think it's going to be under 20 points. Um, mm -hmm. Not total, really? but uh, between the, you know, each team under mm -hmm. 20. I'm going to go... I'm gonna go twenty to thirteen Buckeyes. All right. Well, hey, as long as the Buckeyes are on top. As long as the Buckeyes are on top. So awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, hey man, appreciate you taking the time <laughs> yeah, today. Thanks. It was a great yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Cool. Cool. Awesome.